Hey guys, um, so uh, yeah, part two of this uh, digital media gender and sexuality lecture and much more focus on digital media as I said in the previous video in this one. So where we can start here in this discussion is um, look at what the success of feminism, uh, feminism has been. Okay, so we've, got, we've had second wave feminism since really the 1960s. You know, what are the palpable successes and, and what is left to do really for feminism to achieve its aims, which I think broadly, you know, most right minded people support. So undoubtedly for me, feminism has realised many goals for the better of society and for media as well. And feminism is very dynamic and is continually changing and therefore it's very adaptive. And I think it's a it's a position and viewpoint and ideological statement which is adaptable to changes in media. But there's no doubt in my mind that there is still work to be done in particular with, um, you know, reference to digital media itself. There has been a backlash against feminism in media and popular culture. Undoubtedly, that's the case. As we've seen politics in the Western world in general, but specifically in the US and the UK, swing to the right since the early part of this century, we've seen an intensification of a backlash against feminism and ideologies associated with and specifically as feminism. We've seen an intensification of porno culture over time, which is an issue for feminism, there's no question, and the proliferation of pornographic codes and pornographic images within contemporary society. Um, we see issues with harassment of women through digital media. So digital media for me facilitates harassment of women and facilitates harassment of feminists as well, which is really, really problematic. Feminism um, is described as a form of cultural Marxism. I mean, cultural Marxism is probably the most stupid term ever used because it conflates Marxism, a structuralist form, with cultural studies, which is non-structuralist. So, yeah, dumbasses. But feminism is smeared in that way. And Oh, I should add, cultural Marxism is deeply um, anti-Semitic as a term as well. The patriarchy has certainly not been killed off. And indeed, what we've seen, instead of the patriarchy diminishing to a form, in, instead seeing widespread equality across society, we've seen the formation of things like men's rights movements, which are bizarre because men still have rights, even if feminism achieves its aims. No position on feminism is going to take away the rights of men. That's not what happens. But we do see deeply... You know, problematic instances of men's rights groups and indeed cultural movements which stem from this exceptionalism of men in particular I'm thinking of like the incel movement um, which is massively problematic right wing in, you know has been implicated in a number of right wing terrorist attacks in the United States for example so you know there is work to be done and I think it's the age of digital media that illustrates some of the work that needs still to be done and you know and it desperately needed to be done so, in terms of digital media and gender, um, digital media poses a number of different questions about gender and sexuality compared to the mass media age. What I think are important issues are the possibilities of anonymity, abuse, trolling, and some other factors all have a role in how gender and sexuality issues have impacted on and are being impacted by digital media. And we need to be on top of these and we need to make them a focus of our concern. Anonymity, for example, now anonymity is critical in many areas for empowerment. For example, sharing concerns about coming out to friends and family and honestly on LGBTQ sites or communities, LGBTQ positive sites, I should say. So the on anonymous nature of some online communications can allow for safe expression and performance of gender. Um, and therefore we should be worried by companies like Facebook who refuse to allow anonymous communication you know, steadfastly will not have anonymity on their platform. And that means, you know, identification of people is very, very easy and people feel will feel very uncomfortable expressing their sexuality and their gender in an appropriate way, perhaps. And I mean, this goes beyond feminism, you know, um, on these platforms, which are ubiquitous and are used, you know, extensively by everyone because we are stripped of the right of anonymity to it. You know, this is a real problem. There is a dark side to anonymity, though. Anonymity has positives in terms of the expression of self and the expression of sexuality, expression of gender. 
Anonymity brings with it massive problems as well. So in late 2014, the Gamergate incident showed just how problematic anonymity is. This was really the um, culmination of long-standing debates over sexism versus progressivism in gaming culture. In August uh, 1914, Zoe, uh, 1914, 2014, uh, Zoe Quinn, who was a game developer of the game Depression Quest, was aggressively accused in a blog post by her ex-boyfriend of having cheated on him with a gaming journalist in exchange for positive media coverage of her game. And this became the foundational basis of the Gamergate controversy. So other gamers and indeed non-gamers joined in in this abuse of Quinn on Internet Relay Chat, Reddit, 4chan and other forums where anonymity was guaranteed. So accusations about Quinn started to be spread anonymously and any people who dared to criticise the attack or defend Quinn, like Brianna Wu and uh, Anita Sarkeesian, became targets for huge amounts of misogynistic abuse and extreme hate speech, including rape and death threats. On like a minute by minute basis, you were talking about, I mean, they were flooding in. This wasn't like one threat on somebody's life or one threat to rape. These were happening like 60 times an hour. So basically this became, uh, as Simon Lincoln calls it, a full-scale internet culture war. Um, tapped into a much larger conflict out there over gender, misogyny, visibility and inclusion. And tapped into, and I think made visible, some of the more problematic aspects of internet culture with regards to women, especially on sites like Reddit. You know, something like 4chan um, is probably less problematic because most people will know what they're going to get on 4chan. Certainly in something like Reddit, um, which doesn't, isn't explicitly considered, you know, sort of a site that hosts misogynistic hate speech. The, you know, the visibility, therefore, of misogynist um, and, you know, violent misogynist discourses really, really opened a lot of people's eyes to the problems that women have in online spaces. So rape and death threats for Quinn are not commensurate with claims that this was about the ethics of game journalism. You know, you, you, if you're having an argument about the ethics of gaming journalism, that's something. But what the hell have rape and death threats got to do with games journalism? You know, if you've got a, and actually, if you have a problem here, you have a problem with the journalist. You know, <laughs> the journalist who has broken, or at least, you know, has has behaved in a manner which would contravene journalistic ethics. Um, Quinn isn't the issue, you know, and she never was the issue. But of course, she's the target because the actual issue underpinning this is that a lot of people who occupy these online spaces think women shouldn't have anything to do with video games. And those women that do should be subservient to them. And any woman that isn't like Zoe Quinn is automatically a whore and should be murdered. And when you put it in those terms, you see how brutal this stuff is and how awful this stuff is and how difficult this must have been for Zoe. You know, obviously, I, I can't even begin to empathise with how horrible this must have been for Zoe Quinn and for the other women involved in this case. So uh, at some point, it becomes too much for the system to bear. You can't nail down criminal liability in a case like Zoe's where there's such a huge number of actors. How do you prosecute people when there are thousands hiding behind cloaks of anonymity, doing exactly the same thing. You know, Zoe Quinn can complain to the police, but the, actually the police have got to throw their hands up at some point. There's nothing we can do about this. The structures of digital media themselves have allowed this to occur. They allow people to be anonymous. Even things like Twitter allow you to post anonymously or under a pseudonym. We couldn't, you know, the police couldn't trace all these people even if they wanted to. I. I still think there's an issue there with whether they even wanted to, but they couldn't trace all these people anyway because how digital media is structured itself facilitates this kind of online abuse. It is almost built into, structurally built into the digital media system. You know, and you know, what can you do? All this woman can do in the end is leave these platforms to avoid the abuse. So she's punished because she's being threatened. Her ability to communicate, her ability, you know, as an independent games designer to promote her own work is taken away from her because these people, you know, want to send her vile threats against herself. It's, it's a, when, you, when you think of it in these terms, it's absolutely absurd, but this is the truth of the matter. 
So, um, you know, this taps into sort of a wider element of, you know, how problematic digital media is. In terms of uh, contagion, Hardiker and uh, McGlashan, rape threats on Twitter used against women are a means of controlling women's behaviour. Anonymity enables individuals to freely express opinions that could damage them or cause personal harm and as a shield to attack, offend and harass others while protecting the assailant. And this is talking about Gamergate itself, but I think there's a wider point here that, you know, the structure of digital media itself is used by people to control women, to control... And what I mean by control here is to control women's behaviour. Don't be outspoken. Don't be pro-feminist. Don't be anti-Trump or something like that, you know. We, or we will come after you and there's nothing you can do about it and there's not just one there's thousands and we will take you down and all you have to do you know if you think i'm being extreme here just go on 4chan or something every few minutes you will see like you know a screenshot of something and you know we need to take this bitch down and you know it's a serious issue and it is built in to how twitter functions as a site you know, that you can post anonymously, that you can start an account with just an email address. So you just set up a dummy email address. There's your account. You put up a fake picture and you just start hammering people. Really, um, what I'm getting at here is the idea of gendering of platforms. If Twitter is, through its architecture, a safe space for harassment, then other platforms may be explicitly gendered in this way too. And what I mean by gender in here is that Twitter is gendered for men. You know, men don't get the same problems as women do on Twitter. So it's, a, it's kind of a, a gendered platform in that sense. And it's not a safe platform for women. You know, women can be abused. Women can be targeted anonymously. And we need to think about this gendering of platforms specifically so we think about instagram and selfie culture right there's nothing new about the self-portrait and if you do social media with me next year we'll get into this in a big way what is new is that the form of taking images and the ease of sharing images is very new this instant you know you have a digital camera embedded in your phone you take a photograph and you ping it straight out to instagram and it goes to the world so selfies are their own genre of self visual self reputation with their own conventions representational techniques and poses and it's this sort of conventions representational techniques and poses which i'm interested in here is this something specifically gendered about instagram and selfie culture itself which portrays women in particular ways so you know selfies are social actions they indicate intimate relationships and the common sense of selfies is that they're narcissistic well what does that say about women it, you know, women take more selfies than men, and if um, selfies are seen as narcissistic, is that misogynist? Is this kind of discourse in wider society that kids who take loads of selfies are just so into themselves, what does that say about young females? It's derogatory, right? It's saying, you know, it refuses to acknowledge the pressures that young women are, in, you know, are put under to look their best at all times, especially on a platform like Instagram, which in itself, that in itself, you know, that kind of pressure which comes from this platform is in itself an issue for feminism, I think. But also the flip of that is, okay, so if you do look your best, you're a complete narcissist, you, you, you can't win. You know, it, so it, my solution to it would be stop posting anything on Instagram because you'll never win. You know, if you get it right, you're a narcissist. If you get it wrong, you're ugly. How are you going to win in this one? So selfies really and how they're platformed by Instagram offer a view of who we want to be, not who we are. And that can be quite dangerous. So gendering comes from the, also from the discourses on selfies. You know, duck face is a deliberately gendered pejorative description of a pose, for example. You know, this pose where you suck your, you know, you all know what duck face is, right? You know, but it's done deliberately because you actually look better when you do it because you suck your cheeks in and you push your lips out and those are features. Although, again, going back to the last video, it's almost exclusively from the male gaze why they look better, right? Um, and this kind of performativity of gender in this way, but it's given a pejorative name. You know, it, it, it's not called look, making yourself look better. It's called duck face. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's meant to sound bad, you know. So in terms of Instagram cut culture, you know, um, what other 
problematic aspects we have. We'll post in fitness pictures and the, the um, hashtag Fitspiration on Instagram may signify disordered eating, for example. So we take a very serious problem and reclassify it in a positive way for the platform. You know, if, if you post under, um, you know, with a hashtag like eating disorder, your post is going to get hidden from a hell of a lot of people. So, um, you know, th this is problematic in itself. And appearance focused Instagram use is related to body image concerns in women, body surveillance and the thin and ideal internalization. So these are really serious issues with regards to women and Instagram, the gendering of platforms in this very serious matter matters is something we have to take extremely seriously. Um, if you look back to Twitter again and the Me Too movement, so on October the 24th, 2017, Me Too hashtag began trending on Twitter. So Alyssa Milano, the actress, using his response to allegations of sexual harassment by Harvey Weinstein, who we all know now is behind bars and hopefully never gets out. Milano encouraged other women to join in with the accounts of the harassment to show the magnitude of the problem. So using the hashtag Me Too, you could relate, you know, um, experiences of sexual harassment and worse on Twitter. 12 million uses of Me Too in the first 24 hours. Now, Me Too didn't start on that day. Me Too was, had been going around before then, but this is when it blew it up, if you know what I mean. And we've got a, it's sort of a, a, an indication of hashtag feminism on Twitter. So, you know, Twitter acted in this case as a safe space for women to express these accounts as the volume of accounts create safety in numbers. Not even your most rabid trolls can go around 12 million different people. But there's still a caution to that because still when people were seeing Me Too coming up, they were issuing rape threats. They were just searching for the um, hashtag, finding people who were posting Me Too and sending them rape threats. And just saying, oh my God, we're trying to have a civilization. You know, oh wow, this, this, you know, oh. But I guess what I'm using this example for is maybe we can turn platforms around into safe spaces if women use them. But even in this case, you know, it's got to be in a coordinated vast amount of people. Often you can't do things like that. Uh, you know, and it needed a gatekeeper like Alyssa Milano to start it kicking along. And there's not always a figure with somebody's profile like Alyssa Milano, perhaps, who can who can do that. So this is an exceptional uh, example. And although it's an example of a positive use of the platform Twitter, um, it still has, you know, deeply problematic elements like, you know, people reporting sexual harassment under the Me Too hashtag being threatened with rape. It's just like, it, it doesn't even bear thinking about. So under the analysis of this, still many women that cannot contribute to that debate and, and visibility is not a solution for all women in this case, you know, still women who are excluded from the platform and still women who wouldn't be comfortable contributing to that debate, even with anonymity, because of the nature of the horrendous sort of ordeals that women have been through in terms of their sexual harassment or worse. So harassment is embedded in this culture where pornography is ubiquitous and women's autonomy is translated into always being up for it. I mean, that's um, Rosalind Gill's uh, analysis of sort of porn culture. And really, in terms of that, we, we can see a continuation of this here, that even when women are trying to bring to light issues with harassment and try to create a shared safe space for the airing of um, issues of harassment, harassment is still embedded in that culture. You know, people will come back with harassment. I mean, in some of my work um, in, on gendered platforms, so I looked at location-based social media a lot uh, a few years ago. So, um, I mean, and you might be familiar with these things, you know, when you can check into somewhere, you have a location on your tweet or on your Snapchat um, image or on Instagram, for example. Women were less likely to share location like that on social media because of privacy concerns, because women that I interviewed were worried that um, people would be able to find them. And interestingly, we're worried that if they had location on um, when they were tweeting, when they were sharing information on social media, people might know they're not at home. And therefore they might go, and, you know, I, I genuinely had this, especially for people who live in big cities like London, people might, you know, know, you know, these odd edges you get on social media where you don't really know the people who you're connected to on social media. You know, I had a couple of women who were really concerned that, you know, having the ability to track someone's location on social media made it a real threatening thing. And this, um, you know, 
relates to other platforms as well. So Blackwell et al. looked at uh, Grindr users. They were concerned about being identified by location while wanting to be att attractive at the same time on the application. And I get that, right? Grindr is a platform where you do need to be attractive and you do need to put photos and so on up. You need to attract people on it with very often with like face pics or at least body pics. But um, there's some, you know, not even body pics are problematic. I mean, if I went on Grinder, for example, it's not bloody likely that I am. But if I did, right, somebody would be able to recognise me straight away because I've got really, really distinctive arms, for example, which I can't really hide, um, you know. And somebody would be able to recognise me immediately on a platform like that. And therefore, they would know my location. And it opens me up not just to harassment, but, you know, potentially worse, perhaps. Although I'm maybe bigging myself up a bit too much there. So, in terms of how do we round this up? So, concerns about gender and sexuality have not been solved by digital media. There are some good sides to digital media, you know, the possibility of anonymity and the possible of digital safe spaces, but they are outweighed, I think, by the, by the negatives. You know, so the, the concerns really have been altered, and while there are some benefits, harassment, the potential of harm and abuse are major issues. And it, it just shows that, you know, feminism still has a huge role in contemporary media um, and we need to be supporting feminist initiatives and we need to be generally supportive of the feminist movement in order to solve these problems and to put pressure on the digital media companies to actually do something to rein in the behaviour of misogynists and violent men. Okay, that's all I've got to say on this one. Thanks very much.